<laughs> okay, well, uh, Father Astro is trying to, but you can see there are profound questions asked uh, to get either out or of the. Uh, Ah, it's going to be a lot of slides, eh? Don't seem to find the... Oh, okay, good. Let's go to the beginning. Okay, and there. Uh, sometime about 30 years ago, People were very encouraged by the uh, developments in earth sciences such as plate tectonics, and they changed this uh, terra incognita uh, into terra cognita. Uh, and uh, it's been publishing since then, mostly abstracts from obscure conferences. Uh, What I'm going to talk about is a large scale signatures uh, and the fact that seismic information in some ways is beginning to converge. And even though we are hoping that uh, new methods of, for example, uh, using uh, waveforms, uh, adjoint methods, and so forth will improve the models, uh, at these very large wavelengths, it really doesn't matter because they are resolved by uh, the data that we have presently. Uh, what comes out, what's sort of the bottom line is that Mantu in seismic tomography appears to be uh, more complicated than uh, had been thought, at least by modelers. Of course, I can say only things up to 50 years ago, and probably mostly 20. 50 years ago, there was a friend of mine that made a statement which uh, essentially implied that there is some sign of deep heterogeneity in the Earth mantle. But for real, things began somewhere in 1970s, then accelerated in the 80s, and have been going up ever since. Uh, uh, the, last year, Ritsama and colleagues published as if update of their 1999 paper, which had a very nice Earth model. And they increased the data set by a factor of 10, and nothing much has changed. So I think that as far as this kind of information goes, I, I guess we, have, we are at the limit and things are not going to change uh, very soon again. It compares three different 3D models. Uh, Rhythmus is... Uh, well, Michigan, Cambridge, and Oxford. The second one is uh, Harvard. The third one is Berkeley, uh, Texas, and uh, San Diego. And you can see that uh, at some depths they are pretty similar, that at others uh, they are different. And in particular, this last column, uh, you see little similarity, for example, at depths such as 400 and 600 kilometers. Uh, why is it? Well, for model to be good, to have a chance to be good, it has to contain data that tell us about the whole mantle, not just part of it. So uh, here I compare, well, not compare, but actually show a figure from a paper by Ritzema, same more or less group, in 2004, and they show what happens if, for example, uh, you use only fundamental 
mode surface waves, and your resolution, they must have come only to a certain period, uh, ends at about a uh, little over 300 kilometers. Then you use overtones, and overtones also uh, mean because by summation of all the modes you can reproduce entire seismogram. Uh, so, uh, but in their particular case, they took seismograms apart and measured frequencies of individual modes. And you can see that you have to have this data set to resolve transition zone, structure in transition zone, which is the third picture from the top. And then if you use travel times, teleseismic travel times, which are uh, waves observed beyond, say, 25 degrees distance, because at shorter degrees, the mantle structure makes it difficult or impossible to untangle things. So uh, most people use teleseismic travel times because they are much easier to read and mistakes are seldom made. So uh, if you see the, the models obtained of the mantle above 600 kilometers, essentially reflect average mantle structure with uh, ridges prevailing. You can see them all the way down to 600. So uh, essentially these teleseismic observations, which occasionally are interpreted as very detailed structures, are not resolvable. The upper mantle is not resolvable with lower mantle data. In order to resolve the structure, and it's sort of in the introduction to seismology, you have to have rays that bottom at a particular depth, and hopefully at all the depths, then you can resolve the whole model. Uh, so uh, only the models that, that have these three subsets of data, and you know they have to be given appropriate weight, can resolve things. So here we compare three recent models. Uh, this is the predecessor, S4 qubit, as I say, it didn't really change anything. And uh, so these are data that had fundamental modes, overtones, and uh, teleseismic travel times. And they show five zones with different spectral characteristics. You can see that the structure uh, in the uppermost 200 kilometers ends rather abruptly at about 250 kilometers, that's the first white line. Then you see that, uh, and the spectrum whitens considerably, and then around below 400, you see the growth in the degree two signal, and that's present in all three mo models. And then you have a sudden change, all of a sudden this degree two ends, and uh, a very white, uh, low amplitude uh, spectrum emerges. And then things change again at the very bottom of the mantle. Again, you have a strong degree two and three. Uh, and this line at 2400 uh, is drawn from other observations, uh, uh, which I will talk about later. Uh, but essentially, that's the zoned uh, structure. And there's now we'll look at one uh, particular model because the spectra are very similar. Uh, that's the uh, Harvard model. Its predecessor is shown with the black line. And as you can see, the spectrum, this is RMS to obtain power, you have to square it, uh, decays very slowly to about 400 kilometers, then even south, then jumps again uh, down by a factor of two or so. On the other hand, this newer model, red line, has a strong spectrum at the top to about 200 kilometers. And then with the 100 kilometers, it decreases by a factor of three or by order of magnitude in power. So uh, this is the 
structure, specifically the top one, is at 100 kilometers, and we call it heterosphere. There have been other spheres like tectosphere, uh, well, lithosphere, a stenosphere. Uh, this is simply named for its uh, strength in spectrum in contrast to the region below. Then we get into buffer zone, and here you lose the age signature in the oceans, uh, and you still see bits of cratons, but nowhere as strong as they were before. Uh, and, and again, it's not just cratons, there are other uh, structures. So uh, we erase much of the buffer zone is a difficult uh, region to study because uh, since its power is 10 times less than the picture above, it's very easy to propagate some errors, for example, a wrong anisotropy, no anisotropy, uh, and so forth. So uh, this is still a uh, region in progress can be made. Uh, then you see this erupting degree two, mostly the blue uh, in the Western Pacific, some under South America and South Atlantic. And then again, we jump. We are now in lower mantle. Uh, we call it, it's a very big buffer zone, nearly 2,000 kilometers. And if you remember from studies that were published some time ago, uh, you had very long lines, for example, like the uh, uh, from North to South America. Uh, the signature of the Western Pacific pretty much decayed, except maybe for Indonesia. There are two spots where there are slabs known to be in the upper mantle, and that's, I guess, Peru, uh, around Tonga, Fiji, and Indonesia. But taken as a whole, uh, the slab from these pictures, slab penetration into the lower mantle is uh, not as uh, strong as implied by the earlier studies. It sort of continues like that for nearly 2,000 kilometers, and then we enter abyssal zone. It's a little bit taken, borrowed from Louise with her hot abyssal layer. Uh, we call it abyssal zone, and uh, we'll look at it closely because it has very unusual properties and geometry or spectrum. So the three upper mantle zones I shown here in greater detail, uh, the substantial similarity in the uh, uh, shallow mantle, uh, the buffer zone has distinctly uh, slower Pacific in any case, not Atlantic, uh, and some beginning of seeing the slabs because of the contrast is less than at shallow depths. Uh, and in uh, transition zone, you see this degree two uh, or this Western Pacific uh, South uh, America increased. It's even stronger, more monolithic in the, uh, the Harvard model. It's also strong in uh, uh, Berkeley model, but you just about don't see it in a Texas model and you don't see it at all uh, in the HMSL-S model. So uh, why is it? Uh, well, it's just because the, the last model that I mentioned does not have the data that are sensitive to transition zone structure. Uh, they have surface waves and then teleseismic travel times, but without overtone or body wave data that bottom in a uh, transition zone, you cannot resolve the structure. It's not that it's not there, it's just you cannot pick it up. Heterosphere is shown here in the cross section from 
Peru to Marianas. Uh, the upper part is uh, isotropic velocities. The, uh, and you can see that somewhere around 200 kilometers, the uh, contours bunch up, and uh, there is no, not really much heterogeneity below that white dashed line, which is our either definition or observation of uh, uh, the heterosphere. The heterosphere has some particular properties. For example, it's strongly anisotropic. This black thing, which is somewhere near Hawaii, uh, is as strong as the isotropic uh, uh, heterogeneity or slow velocities uh, under East Pacific rise. Uh, and it has nothing to do with age. It's, it's somewhere, somebody called a cookie sitting under Pacific, and probably implying that there is some uh, vertical influx of the material not associated with Mid-Ocean Ridge. This is another uh, example, and actually uh, Ritzema should be given, uh, in his colleagues, should be given credit for sharpening and distinguishing this heterosphere. Uh, and you can see that this is cross-section through North America then, and then East Pacific rise. And uh, this orange line shows where the heterosphere would begin. And indeed, it corresponds to very dense and rapid increase in heterogeneity. Maybe some slight difference between uh, uh, mid-ocean ridge and acratonic velocities, but it's not really quite sure. But if you look into the rest of the upper mantle, you don't see very much. This is uh, an older model, actually Harvard model, some 10 years old at that point, and the uh, contours are stretched out. We did not really have or did not try for as high a resolution as Ritzema has. However, this rapid change is also observed uh, in the well, most uh, recent Harvard model. There are cross sections from regions uh, marked by different uh, colors. And uh, there are five different keratonic regions. The velocities are not the same, but they bunch up at about 250. There's two sort of differentiated at 250, but certainly merge at 300 or so. Uh, the differences are of the order of 10% uh, at the depth of about 150 kilometers, and that decay to a couple, maybe 1% at greater depth. Uh, the uh, profiles on the right are taken from another model, uh, it's another Berkeley model, and they show similar things other than they converge even more rapidly. So uh, I think that the existence of the heterosphere as a very unique, very highly heterogeneous region is well established, uh, and it contains, if you take the whole model, square the velocity perturbations and in, uh, integrate over from CMB to MOHO, uh, you will find out that 50%, more than 50% of is contained in this top 250 kilometers. So it's a region by itself. The structure doesn't correlate with anything. It's well actually uh, related to surface tectonics. What we do now is cross the 650 kilometer discontinuity. And the first three models show a very distinct change in the spectrum. For one thing, these fast velocities uh, uh, in the Western Pacific and Eastern Asia uh, disappear at 800 kilometers. And essentially, continents and to some extent, ocean, probably the Pacific is still a little bit slower than average. Uh, uh, and the only thing you see is this, these anomalies under Peru uh, and uh, Tonga, Fiji, 
and uh, perhaps Indonesia, although it's weaker than at other depths. You can see actually the same things in a Berkeley model, Texas model, and even in at this depth, 800 kilometers, the, uh, it's still not quite, uh, things are not resolved, but, but you see that there are some fast velocities in uh, South America. Yes. This one? Yeah, the big blue area from the western Pacific. Uh-huh. That's our interpretation. Essentially, there are pictures which, in order to stay on time, I removed some cross-sections uh, that clearly show continuation and stagnation of the slabs. Uh, just above the discontinuity. Well, the fact that that goes away at 800, does that argue against general slab penetration through the transition? The word general uh, is correct, I guess, and I would say that most of the recently subducted material is not penetrating. There are these three spots. Of course, you know, this can change with time, but uh, uh, in terms of the uh, similarity, both in a spectra, you can see that uh, you go to a whiter spectrum, you don't have these uh, large anomalies uh, and go to much higher uh, wave number in the, in the overall structure. Adam? Yeah. Uh, I guess I have a question about at 800 kilometers depth in that lower row, would you say that those patterns are resolved well enough? I'm not terribly happy about it. I, you know, uh, it's, it's a loaded question. Yeah. Uh, when I when I did this experiment of looking in, in depth shells across models some five or eight years ago, uh, where there are blues, uh, the highest velocities in each model persist beneath the blues that you plot at 600 kilometers depth, and so if by chance we're getting the amplitude wrong in tomography below 600, you, you might interpret that to mean the blues continue on down. In, or in other words, the slabs can keep going. Or uh, is it a streaking of signal above 600 that is carried down into the lower mantle by uh, blurring? Well, you know, I'm... Uh, uh the data sets as, as used in these first three sets do uh, uh, resolve these things. So, uh, but what you say could be uh, valid that, you know, this may be places where we don't have uh, enough resolution uh, to distinguish between our uh, data sets. Generally, uh, models built with travel time data sets have a tendency to streak. And there's a nice paper of all the people by both Spackman and Vanderhuis, because uh, Bob distinguished himself by presenting whole mantle models, or, uh, and they had streaks. But, you know, the ones that he wrote then before were artificial and they made a model that was limited to the upper mantle only, but then using the data set that they used to obtain the mantle model, they essentially see very similar structures in lower mantle. So, uh, I would say that uh, I'm quite confident of uh, uh, this structure uh, in a transition zone. Uh, and particularly, this is global model. So you sort of look everywhere, not only, you know, where you have deep earthquakes or something. So, so it's essentially, the nice thing about global models is that, although with limited resol resolution limited to perhaps depends on depth, but uh, 
thousands of kilometers that they actually tell you the properties of the system at these wavelengths. So the, these properties actually seem to change abruptly uh, under 650 kilometers and it, it sort of begins to be accepted uh, but it's a very slow process. I actually thought that we have found it uh, uh, some time ago, like 20 years, but it took a very long time to uh, gather enough independent uh, studies to actually compare them and say, well, it must be for real. Of course, everybody may be making the same error, but I don't think so. Uh, one other thing that you can do in the, uh, between upper and lower Mantu is to look at the travel times, differential travel times of SS minus precursors. D can be 650, 410, or even 220. So this is coverage at the midpoint of the SS data that were used uh, by Yugu. And the coverage is global. Of course, there's nothing like coverage in the Northern Pacific. Uh, it's a little bit weak of the uh, west coast of South America, but basically you can resolve all kinds of structures. So with discontinuities, uh, the 410 has a low amplitude, uh, not very uh, strong and sort of a patchy spectrum. Uh, the 660 is much stronger and the transition zone thickness is measured uh, by differential travel times between 410 and 660, so it does not involve the uh, top of the mantle, which is very heterogeneous. And it appears to be mostly caused by the topography of the transition zone. The transition zone thickness as well as 660 topo are uh, dominated by degree two. And uh, this uh, 660 topography seems very similar to the velocity perturbations uh, in an earlier model. Uh, and uh, meaning that where you have these presumably cold slabs, you also uh, either lower the or uh, go to a greater depth in a transition or simply uh, uh, the uh, weight of uh, heavier material. I haven't, don't know too much about phase transformations, but it seems like both uh, cases are are consistent. So we have a consistency between topography and uh, velocities. Uh, the group that was very uh, early and true uh, about the stagnations of the slabs is the Foucault group. Here's a number of slabs that appear to penetrate to a greater depth, but uh, well, he, uh, Foucault wants to have a, another region in which these uh, uh, slabs uh, uh, stag stagnate, and that's about 1,000 kilometers. We don't see anything in the spectrum uh, that uh, would indicate any major change, but maybe by that time there's little things there. So now we go to lower mantle, and again, we look at 1,000 kilometers. Some of these anomalies are still there in our model. Uh, and uh, others, they're, they're not. Uh, middle mantle is essentially not very uh, well resolved simply because uh, I think the signal is not very strong. If you look at the uh, uh, Ritzimus model, he has a lot of these short wavelength features uh, in the Pacific and, and other places, and he's simply trying to distribute the power, I think, as evenly as possible to keep the minimum norm of the model. Uh, at 2,000 kilometers, you begin to see 
uh, effect of uh, what we call uh, superplumes, uh, and I guess more commonly used term now is LSVPs. So you see it under uh, both African and uh, Pacific. Uh, and of course, the so these things tend to, and, and actually you begin to see this degree two structure with the two reds and the blue uh, between. And that actually appears in pretty much all models. And then we go to, well, we stop 100 kilometers above Kormantu boundary because models sometimes do funny things at the boundaries. So, uh, and as you can see, you see the two super plumes and the uh, blue area between them uh, very well. It's a very well established uh, feature. And uh, actually, uh, even though the amplitudes within uh, the red uh, change and also within the blue, if you plot zero line, actually, it becomes extremely stable. This was the first sort of figure in the background that you have seen. Uh, data and model, well, people have complained, maybe stop now, but have complained before that this large degree two uh, is some artifact of truncation of spherical harmonic function. Here we compare the model at 2800 with travel time delays involving S interacting with the uh, deepest 200 or CMB and one that this uh, follows exactly uh, the pattern on a map as well as that uh, the coverage and CMB is pretty good. Uh, these are either bottoming points or midpoints of refracted waves. Uh, so this, this is really not much of a problem to, uh, to see it. And what this is, is we decided, although it's a uh, cluster analysis, but if you have two, two regions, we essentially decided to make a grid, I guess two by two degrees, uh, and then inquire each of the five models that we used, uh, whether it's faster or slower than average. So when it was slower, we added one. If it was faster, we added zero. And you can see that 95% or more is covered either by slow, all slow, and all uh, fast anomalies. So it's extremely good separation. And uh, there are other features, but the two uh, super plumes or LVZs prevail in all of them. There are only two features that are sort of distinct. There is one which is not clear whether it's resolved this anomaly in Eastern Pacific, a bit over the East Pacific rise. And a surprising thing is we resolved that it actually gets dark red, uh, relatively small anomaly, and that's close to the uh, city of Perm. So until people started complaining that Permian is a geological term, uh, so we are changing it to Perm anomaly. And the characteristic thing about it is that it's relatively small, about a thousand kilometers. Uh, in diameter, and it's seen and distinct from other parts of the superplumes. And uh, so this shows uh, that with the data set that's currently available, it's possible to resolve uh, features as small as this, and that they, there aren't uh, many of them. So that this division into dark blue and dark red is really uh, pertains to uh, smaller things than the two superplumes, with this one or one and a half exception. So what we do now is plot for each of these five models. We get uh, 
an average velocity anomaly for the, its slow points and fast points, and we calculate the average. So these are averages with respect to the reference model uh, uh, plotted as a function of depth. And you can see that the negative anomalies are much stronger than positive anomalies, and they also have very large gradient. Uh, the gradient is shown there, that's very uh, a strong test because uh, uh, sort of small details like 500 kilometers, you know, really uh, can be resolved. And we mark the boundary of a uh, abyssal layer at the place where more or less this gradient changes abruptly by about factor of three or so. Uh, and so, again, remember, I cannot say anything that's older than 50 years, although, you know, that, that's now like this, uh, that perhaps this represents a change in composition within the, uh, the deepest 500 kilometers, and change in composition, I would say, in the slow regions, because by very small adjustment, you could make the, these profiles, uh, adjustment to PREM or whatever is the reference model, uh, you could make these things go straight. So this, this gradient, it doesn't change as abruptly, and it's not so large. Uh, uh, so it could be that the principally anomalies are associated with the slow regions. Uh, want to see how consistent are these models for different harmonics, and here we have sort of cumulative plot where we sum harmonics one and two, so L max is two, then four, six, and so forth, and you can see that for two they barely differ. There's something different with one model, but otherwise they are very, very uh, together. Also you can see that the eastern, or rather western, edge of the uh, African anomaly is very uh, even and sharp uh, and it's well resolved by all the models. At LMAX 6, things begin to pop out. For example, it's clear there is some structure in the Northern Atlantic as well as this feature on EPR begins to show up and complexity grows, but by LMAX 12, you begin to resolve the perm anomaly by all the models, and it doesn't change by adding uh, higher harmonics. However, we think that LMAX 12 is probably where uh, noise, or after LMAX 12, noise begins to pre prevail over signal, and we don't see any uh, uh, further complications. Uh, there are sort of distinct features within uh, these uh, uh, models summed up to different LMAX, and one of them, and I saw that also in things that Ed was showing, is this sort of protrusion African, well, intrusion of the uh, faster region, uh, as well as uh, elongation of the Pacific anomaly, and then essentially the sort of uh, Hawaii protrusion which makes the edge of this anomaly closer to Hawaii. Uh, and then there's under Tonga uh, is a sort of intrusion of the blue stuff, and that's sort of very common between these models. So, uh, yeah. Oh, time. Okay. Uh, well, you will not miss dinner, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so we are getting close to it. it uh, basically, I think there is dichotomy between very large wavelengths uh, features in the lower mantle and the short wavelengths. And in order to uh, map the shorter wavelengths, we'll have to somehow increase uh, the resolution of our observing system. And Ed mentioned today that uh, this the idea of global ar uh, array of broadband arrays, or GABA. Uh, and uh, this figure shows that the large features, 
that it's not really limited to the core man to boundary. That in two models, each is seen from below and from above. It's truncated at 800 kilometers, not to show all the uh, complexities near the surface. Uh, but you can see that at a, I guess it's minus 0.5% contour, these things go from uh, all the way from the Corman to boundary to, so it's, it's possible that uh, they can be actually super plumes. Okay, we change a little bit now. Okay, uh, a puzzle. In 1992, Richardson and Ergebretsen wrote a paper where they compared uh, four uh, kinds of things uh, uh, that this, well, only for degrees two and three. Uh, and this geoid, hotspots, seismic structure, and what's uh, strangest is subduction, but not subduction today, it's subduction integrated over the last 120 million years. And as you can see, all these features, uh, the similarity between seismic structure and geoid was pointed out uh, uh, earlier. The same for the hotspots, but the first time that the subduction entered or its uh, total or uh, cumulative result in uh, entered into the discussion. However, uh, they changed their mind uh, and thought that actually all these slabs still hang on in a uh, mantle somewhere. Uh, there is a number of uh, different conditions, but basically this is intended to represent the sequence. There's something like 20 layers, I show only a few of them. Uh, and uh, the three top ones are in upper mantle and the rest is in the lower mantle. And Mark sent us this model to try to shoot rays to compute the travel times, but it doesn't work. This is the model at 2,500 kilometers. Uh, the slab model, that's where slabs get, a lot of slabs get subducted under uh, Alaska and Kamchatka. And this is seismic model. And if you particularly, well, there's a very little similarity. Uh, and you, if you compare power spectra, the degree two is huge and essentially the slab model well, actually happens to have a maximum at degree two, but it doesn't differ very much from higher degrees. So it's pretty flat spectrum. So uh, trying to see how it works, we first summed the mass subducted uh, during last, whatever, 15 million years. Uh, and uh, this is plotted on the, uh, in colors, expansion to degree 18. Uh, uh, the picture on the right. And then we took all the slabs from the top to the bottom uh, and added them up. And we obtained the sum on the right hand side. And then we decided to compare it with the velocity model. So upper mantle is sort of a test. Uh, at the top, we plot velocities at 650, uh, or this is actually 600, and then compare it with the summed uh, slab model. And so, you know, they seem to be in a similar place, but uh, a different shape. And of course, there are no uh, strong negative anomalies. But if you put it through degree two filter, and if you remember the, that zone is, uh, uh, spectrum is dominated by degree two, then these things look identical. There's actually sort of like 99.9 .9 correlation, which I think is accident. Uh, so uh, it appears that it works in the sense that if you take the seismic spectrum, that there is this, uh, very strong wave number filter somehow, and that you have perfect agreement for 
uh, degree two, but not for other degrees. And now we are trying to do it in the lowermost mantle. Again, this is the model at 2800, model uh, all degrees, uh, and then just degree two. And again, you see that they are very similar. Slabs are a little bit more, t more tilted. Uh, this actually is really centered on the equator. And if you add degree three, degree three in slabs has more, four times more power than degree two, uh, and it is too strong, uh, and it breaks, for example, the African superplume. However, you can see that the maxima in velocities are in the same place as maxima uh, under degree three. So other than in the slabs, degree three is overrepresented or is too strong, uh, it correlates, actually correlation for degree two and three is better than for the sum of them. So what does it mean? Uh, because in slab model, all these slabs are still suspended somewhere in a uh, mantle. Uh, I'm not sure what to expect in terms of the seismic velocity anomalies, but they turn out to be very similar to the filtered result of a total column of slabs. So the conclusion is that the uh, velocity anomalies in the Rollins mantle represent a long time average of the subduction process. Okay, so that the cycle tends to repeat itself, maybe not exactly, and this is why there is difference in degree three, it's probably significant enough that it could uh, change convection, but that basically, and I, I don't know how long this time is, but that it's certainly more than, say, 200 million years. This degree two has very unusual geometric properties. When you plot it for these three models, you essentially get the identical picture. There's some difference in amplitude, but all of them are within degree or two. Uh, slow anomalies are centered on the equator. Uh, of course, the antipodal, because degree two has to be like this, but they all have the same geometry. It turns out that by random number generator that it's less than one in thousand chance that they would be uh, oriented like this by a random process. So what does it mean? Well, it means that uh, if the red is associated with a effective density anomaly that's positive, then the mantle rotates about the, so that axis in the equatorial plane uh, is the axis of minimum moment of inertia, as, as it should be. Uh, the case is slightly degenerate between, uh, because all this polar circle in blue, in the middle of the blue, uh, is, has, it's, a, it's a essentially trace of the maximum moment of inertia, which turns out that the two are equal. And on the top of it is plotted the true polar wonder uh, curve for the last 200 million years. And it's not exactly, but it more or less uh, follows. Uh, there are people who don't believe in Bess and Kurt Yo data, but uh, it was published some time ago, so we didn't invent it and couldn't find a simple listing for other true polar wonder results. So uh, this talk, and I didn't make individual points, tells us that there are two big things. Uh, one is the, uh, I, I jumped off that last slide a little bit too early, because if the probability is so low and that orientation of this anomaly is such that it is associated with rotation of the Earth, one possible explanation would be this very, very old feature uh, that developed uh, maybe at the time when Earth was still uh, cooling off at some stage, cannot 
uh, cannot say it, but it's essentially implication of this very unusual orientation and alignment with the rotation axis. Okay, so there, there are these five regions which uh, I think uh, require that there would be a changes in composition or in uh, temperature, could also be changes in viscosity, which we cannot, you know, uh, thermal expansion coefficient, whatever, all the things that seismologists cannot measure, and actually among them is it's really so difficult to model uh, density uh, in three dimensions. So, uh, uh, so there are these five regions, and they have to be explained in some way. And then uh, uh, the second one is more speculative, but essentially uh, the, the bottom structure at the bottom of the mantle, which you know with lower amplitude extends uh, for a long time, uh, uh, for nearly to well to the bottom of upper mantle, uh, that this large structure we named it. Uh, mantle ankle structure and that it essentially can uh, in a broad range uh, can or appears to be uh, controlling the uh, tectonic activity. There's also where there is degree 2 in uh, say high velocities there is also degree 2 in hotspot expansion, and it's right above these big red things in the lower mantle. So that's the additional evidence. I mean, basically, the fast and uh, cold or uh, slow anomalies uh, seem uh, to be uh, coupled. And one is the process of upward upwelling, the other one is downwelling. And Difficult to say, but actually it seems that the the upwelling process, in terms of these contours that I have shown you, these pillars in the mantle, uh, seem to be more continuous than a higher velocity uh, region. So um, that's some. Uh, so uh, the last slide. What should cider do? And uh, from the very beginning, which really took place about. 10 years ago when the first proposal was funded is that this group and uh, its representatives are very competent in if they want to have open minds to uh, re-examine the way that we think about uh, convection or dynamics of the mantle and that create a working group which would not solve the problem, but would identify questions that need to be asked uh, to uh, make progress. It may be stage-like. There, there are, for example, like the existence of heterosphere. You know, there are some way. Uh, there are some models that propose there is a weak layer in the mantle, and that the plate movements and movements of the uh, the main convection pattern uh, can be separated. It also helps to uh, in other things. So for example, this is sort of issue that could be uh, addressed. Uh, it's not clear what to do with continents. Uh, but for example, the other issue, which you know is not going to be solved on its own, but what is it that needs to be done to make these slabs pond and what happens to them afterwards? Because we really cannot see whether they actually go in some avalanches down. Uh, what you know? How this uh, structure at the bottom got to be so big, and so forth. But I, I think that there is enough evidence from this uh, global seismic tomography to to begin uh, uh, seeking some other avenues of. Uh, uh, so it's a nice opportunity to start a new paradigm. Thank you.
that's the similarity between this and model. It's quite surprising to me. Um, because in the period of tomography, the variation is allowed, I mean, between different models. I'm wondering how if all of these models uh, was based on the overhaul of free oscillation? Or? Well, there are uh, in the one of the uh, four models, uh, the splitting data on free oscillations were also used. Otherwise, it, for the lower mantle, it was mostly uh, travel times or waveforms. For the transition zone, uh, either overtones or also waveforms, also uh, free oscillation splitting or uh, and for the topmost structure, uh, surface waves to uh, different uh, maximum period, which means that the penetration sensitivity among the different data sets was, was different. But I mean, in the lower mantle near the chromatal boundary, uh -huh. I mean, in near the chromatal boundary, which of the method really dominates the velocity uh, structure? Uh, yeah, sure. As diffracted helps greatly to fill. Uh, oh, that's why I showed the figure where I compared the travel time anomalies uh, with a model, and you basically see the same features in both so you, without inversion uh, and removing thousands of parameters. You can actually see it uh, with your own eyes. Uh, so there is, uh, as they say, there were complaints that seismologists introduce artifacts. And it was mostly to support or to explain the fact that geodynamic models don't agree with seismic results. Okay, one more question. Uh, uh, Hello, uh, my name is Sarah. I guess uh, um, yeah, this degree two structure has been there for about 200 beginning years, that you suggest. I think that's actually, uh, that we also, our model actually, I kind of agree with that as well. Uh, but beyond that, I think it's kind of more questionable. Uh, in particular, uh, if, you, uh, if you look at the, um, um, the, the paleogeography or the reconstruction of the continental model, you know, subcontinent and Osambi, all that, if you actually see like the collusion between the Gaon and the Russia, they actually occur. Uh, according to these models, right? According to uh, this uh, geological model, they actually occur right in, uh, right uh, uh, where the African football is. Uh, so that means actually back in like uh, around 330 million years ago, uh, there actually has been a lot of subduction going on in the African hemisphere. Um, so I think that's actually, uh, uh, that really kind of uh, imposed a lot of difficulty for, uh, you know, for models like, you know, well, I'm not saying that it's forever. It was sort of a speculation based on this, uh, you know, extremely low probability that this is sort of a, a random result because it requires the axial symmetry. It requires essentially the degree m equal two coefficients uh, would be uh, some of their squares would be equal to the square of uh, C to zero, uh, so it's 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 pretty unusual. It's pretty difficult to get it randomly within the limits shown by comparison of these three different models. Uh, so I, I think that uh, you know probably it would be good to look back. I'm not saying it was always the same. That there is uh, particularly in this degree three and higher degrees, there's possibility of 
moving things around. R right now, for example, the African anomaly seems to be very, very squashed, uh, while Pacific is more round. And I'm not really quite sure, but it, obviously, you know, it's not degree two. There, there's major contribution of other degrees, and these might change with time. It's the degree two that only, contrib that only contributes to the moment of inertia. So that's why this rotational symmetry, potential rotational symmetry, is so important. And, and probably, you know, uh, at what chance, oh, at one, 999 uh, out of 1,000 probability that it's worth looking at, I guess. This is one in, well, no, I, uh, you know, well, 200 million years is to get these anomalies where they are now uh, from uh, the uh, slabs that are still in the mantle. So that's why we calculated the sum as Mark started, but then got away from it. 